Uh, how, how are you all doing? Are you all happy? Yes. Yes. Anyone, anyone angry? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, something I've been working on recently called Fury. Uh, how many people here have heard a little bit or anything at all about Fury? There's a few hands go up, going up. Not everybody, though. So Fury um, is often described as a build tool, which is partially accurate. But I think more importantly, it is a dependency manager. Uh, so it, it's, it's a different problem being solved than what SBT does, but there is a, some, some significant overlap between the two. So in designing Fury, as with many other things I've, I've worked on, I, I tend not to be too interested or excited with things unless I'm breaking conventions or trying to find alternative ways of doing things. Often those experiments fail disastrously, but sometimes, um, I think at least, I, I, I catch on to an alternative way of doing something, and I hope Fury very much fits into that, uh, that category. So one thing Fury does differently is to define builds as data, not as code. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that decision later. It prefers to depend on sources rather than binaries. And there's no build file as such, not, not in the familiar sense. I mean, it, we're not writing code, we're writing data. So we modify this file using git commands, git style commands. So we're running command line um, calls, which will uh, mutate that file. And it's interactive. So let's talk about builds as, as data rather than code. All of the relevant parts of the build, all of the information that Fury needs to compile your Scala code, and this is, I'm talking about multi-phase compilations here with things like compiler plugins and all your dependency details, where it's going to fetch those dependencies from, that's all represented by a data structure. Inside Fury's code, there is an, an ADT which represents that data. So these graphs, the relationships between the different compile phases, the steps in, in, in compilation, are not Turing complete. We can know them just by inspecting the data structure. So that's uh, something we have access to without needing to compile anything, without having to go through the process of compiling code and then running it just to work out what our graph of dependencies is. We have the, we have the data there already. And what this gives us is simplicity. It's fast, we can analyze it, we can reason about it. And this is a huge advantage. Fury is very, very fast and very responsive when you use it. Let's talk about source dependencies. There's some debate over whether source dependencies or binary de dependencies work better, and there are pros and cons to both. But uh, I, I do prefer source dependencies, and I think if people started using uh, Fury, they would appreciate um, some of the advantages. I've got, I'm getting a thumbs up from, uh, from Oscar at the back. Um, so this is what Basil does as well. The thumbs up give you a free mention of Basil. <laughs> and uh, so, so source dependencies offer a lot more flexibility. I think there's a greater chance if you, if you depend on, uh, on, on sources that you can successfully compile uh, some code. If you, if you have the binary that's built for the wrong version of Scala, it's not going to work. If you have a binary that's built for the wrong version of another library, it might work, if you're lucky. And what, what Ivy tends to do is, if, if you end up with a version conflict between uh, two, two dependencies on subtle different, subtly different versions of the same library, it will just evict one version of that. This is the diamond dependency problem. And we just have to hope that all of that links successfully at runtime when we come to run it. That seems really quite dangerous. With source dependencies, we never, we never separate the binaries from the sources. So the compiler will check for us whether that compiles or not. Maybe it compiles, maybe it doesn't. But we never have a situation where we're trying to run code that might not link, where we might get a no such method error or a, a class not found. Uh, we don't. We don't have to wait for the binaries to be published. We can just grab the sources, or Fury can grab the sources on your behalf, and work from those, rather than waiting for 
the project maintainer to go through the quite convoluted process of publishing to, to Maven Central. And anybody can publish. It doesn't have to be the project owner. If you want to publish a build, or if you want to publish a variant of uh, another library, you can fork it. You have all the tools that Git provides you. You can take advantage of all of those um, in, in, in your build definitions. And I already made that point. So the other, the other point I mentioned at the beginning was that Fury, Fury works through a command line interface. And I, I don't know about you, but I quite like using Git from the command line. I'm familiar with it. I trust it. Uh, there's no complicated GUI. There's not a large configuration file that I have to edit. I mean, you, there are some configuration files in Git. But I wanted to replicate as much as possible that interactivity. Uh, and as I said, running a command will typically change the build, the build file. You don't, you don't need to see that build file. You don't need to edit it. You can, you can rewrite it. You can, you can query it using, using Fury. Um, we, we do actually use Git itself to, to track changes. It's version controlled like anything else. Uh, the output that you see is nice, beautiful, colorful. Uh, obviously, that's what counts in any build tool. But on, on, on a serious point, there's a lot of things, a lot of information you, you, you receive when, um, when, when using a build tool. Some of it will contain things that are project names. Some will be module names. Some will be repositories. Some will be URLs. These all have different colors. And you will learn to associate those colors with the type of thing you're looking at. It's all part of the user interface and user experience to give you as much information, as much indication uh, and, and intuition about what you're seeing as possible. And my favorite part is that you get tab completion, which works uh, pretty well. It's, it's quite smart. It will, uh, for example, look at the parameters you've already specified and maybe constrain later parameters you haven't yet specified. So um, the tab completion is pretty adaptive, pretty good, and uh, makes, makes it very easy to make these changes and uh, to, to run the commands very fast. So let's just show you a little bit about what it's like to use. Uh, to add a new project, we can run a command like this, fury project add, and then we give it a name, and that's going to be Magnolia for this example. We can add a module. Don't worry, I'll, I'll explain what a module and a project are soon. We can add a, uh, a module to the project called Magnolia. We can call that core. And if we wanted to add a reference to a source repository, so I'm, I'm defining this, this fresh, uh, fresh build for building Magnolia. I need the Magnolia sources in, either, in order to build them. So I can add this dependency. I can use this GitHub shorthand uh, definition here. And I'm going to name that. I'm also going to name the repository Magnolia as well. So I've got something short to refer to it by. If you don't, if you don't provide that, it will just assume the same name there. So this is actually redundant. And then having defined the project, having defined the module within the project, I want to add those sources from a particular directory, from the source slash core directory of the Magnolia repository. I want to add those to the module I've just created. So now that module knows what it will be compiling. And the module is basically a single invocation of the compiler with some class path, with some sources, maybe with some binary dependencies as well. Uh, and it will produce some set of class files. Uh, we do need to specify the compiler. So by default, you'll get the Java compiler if it doesn't know any better. But if we specify, if we update the module to, to use the Scala compiler, uh, we, we, can, we can do that like this. And then to compile it, we just run Fury. Now, I was going to do a demo, but as with uh, most projects I work on, uh, they spend the majority of their time uh, not working, and uh, at least during, during my development work. And, uh, and consequently, I broke it yesterday. And uh, because I've modified the build file format, all my build files don't work for the previous version that worked. So um, all I can show you today is a video which I've actually published on, uh, on, on Twitter. But this is, 
this is what happens when you, when you run Fury. This is Fury building itself uh, in, in real time. Slightly blurry. So as you can see, there are, there are various project names listed. Uh, they're linked between them. Those, those lines show the dependencies. The modules which are highlighted are the ones that are compiling at that particular time. You've only got one at the moment. And it, it, it finished and, uh, and we're done. So that was building Fury itself from source with uh, no, no binary dependencies. It was building all of the dependencies as well. It, it took about, um, well, it was about 30 seconds. It, it's up to about a minute now. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a couple of months old. Uh, so that, that's, that's the experience you get. If you run it multiple times, uh, it gets faster and faster because it doesn't need to build the same stuff again and because the compiler is uh, running hot. So I use Bloop for that. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about Bloop, but uh, Bloop is what provides the actual building uh, backend for, for Fury. And it's made Fury possible. Without, without Bloop, which is developed at the Scala Center, uh, I, I really couldn't do this. But maybe we want to depend on another library in our module. So what I've described so far is building just one, one project, one module, uh, without any external dependencies. So if I want to depend on another library, there's actually a few steps involved here. I need to depend on a, to depend on a definition for a, uh, a workspace, I'll explain that soon, that contains uh, a, a, a project definition. So if I want to depend on shapeless, maybe on GitHub type level there is a shapeless.fury repository published. Maybe, maybe Miles Sabin, who wrote shapeless, would, would publish that. So I'm going to add that source repository. Now, this is a source repository not on sources, but on a build. It's dealt with in the same way because it's managed as any other repository is. And from that repository, I'm going to import the, from, the, from the shapeless repository, I'm going to import the Scala 2.12 schema. Now, I'm using words like workspace schema and so on without really explaining them. Don't, don't worry for now, but you, you can guess that Scala 2.12 is related to a particular version of the compiler. And that's the, that's the variant we're importing. And then finally, I add the dependency uh, to my current module on shapeless slash core. Uh, and you get, you get tab completion on this once this is imported. So three steps, very, probably very unfamiliar to what you've, um, what you've worked with so far if you're familiar to using SBT. But uh, this, this is how it's done in Fury. And I'll, I'll explain over the next few slides why. There's one other thing worth mentioning at this point, which is uh, support for forking. Say I discovered a bug in Shapeless, or maybe even a missing feature. Now, when I cloned that, uh, when, when I depended on that source repository for Shapeless, that gets cloned in the background. It gets hidden away in a, in a directory called dot .fury, so you don't see it. And you don't really have to worry about those sources, where they are or what they're doing. They're part of your build. They get built when you compile your project, but they're not really under your control. What you can do with Fury is you can actually bring an external project that you're depending on into your control. You can fork it out of managed space into a directory on your hard disk. And then you can edit that. You can edit those shapeless sources exactly as you edit your own projects. You've effectively got your own cloned copy, which you can then fork. You can create a pull request back to the uh, original shapeless if, if, you, if you want to make a change. Now, compare that to the experience with Maven or uh, SBT. If you have a binary you depend on, first of all, you have to go and clone the right version of the sources that correspond to the binary you're currently working on. Then you have to build them. And well, maybe you make maybe you make a change. Maybe maybe the thing you want, the bug you want to fix, you change that. You publish them locally. Now, hopefully, there's no other projects in between the thing you depend on and, and your project. Otherwise, you've got to fix everything on along the way. But you publish a snapshot to your local Ivy cache. You change your build to depend on that snapshot. 
And then you can test whether the change you made back there actually fixed anything or whether you need to go back and reiterate over and over again every time. Has anyone had this experience? Yeah, so a few, a few, has anyone uh, found a better way? Okay, so there's a plug-in to make it easier. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so there are there are alternative ways. Um, with with uh, with Fury, you just fork it into a different directory, and it's part of your project. You can watch the files, you can just edit them, and it all just rebuilds whenever whenever you want. So that experience, I think, should be nicer, and also really encourages contributions. If you if you find a if you find an issue, if you find a, a new feature you want to add, it's really really easy for you to contribute back to the project. Uh, and then when you've, when you've defined your project with modules and so on, you probably want to share it with other people as that hypothetical shapeless.fury repository was shared. And because it's just a Git repository that's managing the, the build file, all you have to do is push it to a repository on Git, and it's available instantaneously for other people to depend on. There's a command in Fury that, that does that. It also does some additional checks to make sure you don't publish something that... Uh, that doesn't link correctly, for example. Uh, and it's a, it's a one-liner. It tags it with this, uh, this tag here. And that's available. You can tell people on Twitter seconds later that it's available. We don't have to wait ages for, for everything to be released. So some concepts. Let's talk about workspaces. So I've, I've, I've mentioned workspaces before. A workspace is a collection of projects. And a build file defines a workspace. And each uh, project in that workspace, and by the way, frequently a workspace will only contain one project. Um, frequently they will contain many. Uh, but a project contains one or more modules. And if you remember, a module corresponds to running the compiler once. And the inputs are the same. There's source files, there's a class path, uh, there's a choice of compiler, and probably some compiler parameters. That's more or less everything that goes into defining what that module, how that module runs. And the outputs are the same every time as well. The, the outputs will be basically class files, and they feed directly into the next compile phase, the next module, on the class path. So this, this is a compilation graph. It's a DAG. Is everyone OK with that kind of model? Just think of a, a, a DAG with each module being running the compiler, and then they're feeding class files between them. And as I mentioned before, we can publish workspaces as Git repositories. So let's take a, maybe a more realistic example. These. Uh, the, these, these rectangles here are meant to represent workspaces. The green squares are projects, and the blue dots are modules within them. Oscar. I, you just popped this up to the stack. You're going to come to it later. But you kind of mentioned compiler or version kind of uh, being connected to your workspace. And I hope you'll have an opportunity to talk about uh, kind of like the, the cross-build matrix of disaster that we have to deal with as open source libraries a lot of time. Yeah. So I have, I have slides on cross-building and uh, also diamond dependencies. Yeah. The, the, uh, like you've, you've picked on probably the two most important things for like, solving problems with builds. Yeah. So uh, let, let's, let's consider we have three workspaces. One defines shapeless, one <coughs> defines spire, and one defines cats. Oh, sorry, the, the blue dots are modules. So the blue dots are invoking the compiler. And maybe you know that shapeless and cats both depend on macro paradise. Uh, this, is a, this is a compiler plugin which, which enhances what you can do with macros. Uh, Spire doesn't, as it turns out. Now, note what these arrows are linking. They're linking the workspace to the workspace. So, what I intend to imply here is that the, the workspace inherits 
from another workspace. So this is a workspace published on Git. This is a different Git repository. And cat is going to import from Macro Paradise. Likewise, shapeless will. And the dependencies between the modules become possible when, when we have inheritance of the workspaces. So if, if you think about cats, this, is, this project is cats. This is uh, cats effect, say. They've each got a couple of modules. And the, the orange arrows are links between them. It's not a very complicated graph. But uh, you can see that because, because the cats workspace depends on the Macro Paradise workspace, projects defined in Macro Paradise are available for us to depend on. Spire cannot depend on projects defined in Macro Paradise unless it inherits from that, that workspace. OK? Say if it's not. Uh, and we can, we can take this a bit further. So we could actually define a type-level workspace. Now, type-level workspace, as I've drawn it here, doesn't actually define any of its own projects, but it pulls in others that maybe we want to include together. Shapeless, Spire, Cats. They're all mnemonics. They're all type-level projects. So let's bring them all together and share that as a workspace that other people can depend on. And if they, or inherit, inherit from, and if they pull in the type level workspace, all of those projects are available for them to depend on. So they can depend on cats, they can depend on shapeless. So it's one import, you get all of those type level projects available to you. And we can go even further. The community build. Why not bring in other non type level projects? Why don't we compose our workspaces in such a way that we can aggregate sets of projects and distribute them? So when you define your project in your workspace, you can just depend on the community build. And it brings in all of these, and, and many more. A very important point, uh, which I will describe a bit later in more detail, is that when you import a workspace, you are guaranteed to, Im to be importing a coherent set of projects. That means that if there's a project called Shapeless, you know that it will be exactly one version of Shapeless. It won't be, uh, there won't be any diamond dependencies, diamond inheritance, where you have two different projects which depend on version one and version two of Shapeless, and that somehow has to be reconciled. That's reconciled already in the workspace. You can't publish a workspace unless you've reconciled your dependencies. So for any workspace, a project name resolves to unique definition for that project. But that's something you have to do as the, uh, as the publisher of the workspace. Let's talk about schemas. Schemas are my answer to cross-building. So as, uh, as Oscar mentioned, you have um, variations of builds that work for different backends, different, uh, different versions of Scala. Uh, sometimes different minor versions of Scala. So if you're depending on the internals of the compiler, you need to publish a different version of your plugin or whatever it is uh, for each minor version. Uh, if, we're, if we're using Scala.js or Scala native, we have different backends. These typically present themselves as uh, different cross builds, which make the whole, the whole building process with SBT somewhat more complicated. Uh, and you may even have the need to depend on different versions of the same library. You want to support different versions. Um, now, this isn't typically called cross-building in SBT, I don't think, but it is a form of cross-building. We've got different targets uh, or even different libraries. So I think there are libraries which offer uh, integration with either CATS or Scala Z. And they, they publish two different versions, normally with underscore cats or underscore Scala Z. So I propose schemas as a, as a way of uh, supporting this and, and all of these variations. And a schema is actually a complete copy of the entire workspace. All the projects, all the modules, all of the definitions that are in that ADT. Uh, each schema is a complete copy, but with some variations. Now, those variations may be a different compiler. 
the variation might be you depend on a different commit hash of a source repository. They may be you add an additional source directory to a module. Um, it might be you add a whole new project. It doesn't matter, but you can edit them as, uh, as a completely independent, well, almost completely independent copy of the workspace. So you might ask, why, do we, why not just use different workspaces for <coughs> different, in, instead of schemas? Why, why introduce this new concept? The reason is uh, that the tooling is designed to make it easier to maintain these. Because these builds, these definitions, the workspaces, the schemas, they're broadly the same for any, any given project, any given workspace. The, two, the 2.12 version is probably largely the same as the 2.11 version. But we do need to maintain these differences. So the, the tooling, by which I mean Fury, is designed that you can either change things globally or you can make a specific change to just one schema. And I've tried to design it, and I'm, I'm open to uh, redesigns of the actual, of how this actually works, but I've tried to design it so that it, it's quite intuitive whether you're changing just one thing or changing everything across all schemas. So adding, adding, a, adding a project is probably something you want to do globally. Adding a module, probably globally. Uh, adding a, a source directory of shims that are needed to compile for Scala 2.13, that's something which you would want to add just to one schema. Uh, and the nice thing is that it's, it's, it allows you to change everything if you want. It's not, uh, it's not limited to just a changing compiler or just, a, just some magic relating to source directories. It's, it's the entire thing. And you can get a, a nice diff between the two. Remember, we're working with data. It's a, it's a tree structure, but... Uh, you can run a command in Fury and get an instantaneous diff of, um, of the differences. And that, I hope, will give you the information you need to maintain these variations and uh, make it clear to you, and easy to understand what's happening in your build versus, or your, your schema versus uh, a different one. So let's look at this, uh, this hypothetical workspace graph again. I didn't give you the complete story before. Uh, because actually, when you inherit from a, another workspace, you inherit from a particular schema in that workspace. And the names of the schemas can be anything you like, um, but a typically good name would be Scala 2.12 if it's compiling for Scala 2.12. So let's say that um, the type level workspace depends on the Scala 2.12 schema in each of Shapeless, Spire, and Cats. This is something you specify when you, when you import it. Uh, but because Macro Paradise is maintaining versions for every different minor version, we're going to call that dependency Scala 2.12.7. Maybe you'll notice that this one depends on Scala 2.12.4, which uh, maybe is worrying because we have uh, a conflict here. Uh, and actually, the, the schema might be called something like latest. So the community build might depend on the latest version of type level at all times. So let's look at that potential conflict again. I have a project down here. You can't, this, this is, uh, I can't remember what this is meant to say. This, let's say this is, your, this is your project. You depend on both Shapeless and Cats, and they both depend on Macro Paradise. This is depending on version 2.12.4. This is ver version 2.12.7. So we've actually got a diamond dependency problem. We're depending on different versions of macro, the Macro Paradise project. We don't know, given this, how to resolve that, that module there. We don't know what we're compiling. We don't know what the sources are. We don't know what compiler's being used. So with, with Fury, this is not something you can build. Any subtle difference is not, uh, not permitted. But down here, in, in the workspace that depends on more than one other workspace and that, that actually brings together the conflicting workspaces, you have to resolve that. And you resolve that by choosing one or the other. You either choose the cats version or the shapeless version. And you, you redefine the Macro Paradise project down here, which means that when you publish your workspace, this one at the bottom, 
it will be fully resolved. And that, that project that's defined down there will effectively shadow the two variants up here. So that when CATS is compiled, it will use your definition. When Shapeless is compiled, it will use your definition. And the two definitions that are used up here are never used. And you can, you can change that in any way you need to in order to make them both compile. Now, diamond dependencies are not, there's no silver bullet for, for fixing them. There are always going to be issues. Sometimes the solutions will be um, as hard as you need to actually fork either Shapeless or Cats or Macro Paradise in order to get everything to compile together. Sometimes the APIs just don't match up and you've got no, you've got no possibility of making them work, it, work unchanged. But Fury gives you the ability to fork. If you really want to, and I don't, I don't recommend it unless it is really necessary, you can fork these projects. You can, you can upgrade Shapeless to use the 2.12.7 version of Macro Paradise. You can send a pull request back to the repository very easily, and maybe Miles will merge it. So, plugins. Who likes SBT's plugins? I don't, don't feel you can't say, yes, I like them. I think more people like SBT. Like, it even says, people like SBT's plugins. <laughs> you, do like, you do like the plugins, right? People always talk about the, the, the great plugin ecosystem with SBT. Like, give SBT some credit. Uh, and they, 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 uh, they do offer quite a wide variety of features. There's a lot of things you can do with plugins. Uh, often it seems to me like for any problem you have with SBT, there's a plugin to solve it. Uh, so um, the question is, how, how, will, how will Fury support these plugins? And I, I said when I gave this talk at Scala.io that uh, Fury will have a, uh, a plugin uh, API over my dead body because I think it's, uh, it's signing your death warrant to, uh, to commit to an API that needs access to the internals of, of uh, a build tool. Uh, it, it becomes so hard and so fragile to work with, and it restricts your ability to, to innovate and change things. If you, if you create an ecosystem of plugins, you have to support them. And I'm, I'm making the decision that Fury will not support uh, plugins, at least not in the same way as you're maybe familiar. So I've got three answers to this question. The first one is it won't. Uh, the second one is natively. So a lot of features could be brought into Fury as native features. So uh, things like code coverage, that could, that could become, a, become a part of Fury itself. Uh, and this is, this is, I guess, if, if you're familiar with um, like the Linux kernel versus the Windows NT kernel, um, the Linux kernel defines everything, every driver. It's part of the same piece of software, essentially. Windows NT is a microkernel and uh, has interfaces for, for everything to, to connect to it. This is taking the Linux approach. So certain things could, be, could become native features and that, that requires some sort of uh, um, rapid release cycle, which remains to be seen, seen whether we can do that. But uh, it does give me the ability to fully integrate those features into Fury and give you a better user experience. And finally, as libraries. Now, I mentioned the, uh, the graph of compilations. And each node in that graph is basically a module, an invocation of the compiler. And I realized at some point that in addition to compiling the sources for that module, I could additionally run them. I could run a main method. So I could run the thing I've just compiled. And that main method could do all sorts of things. It could uh, generate sources, for example. No sources could feed into the next step. Now, hopefully, that's deterministic. You probably want it to be deterministic. But um, if, if, if you want to opt out of that, then you, then you can. But it gives us the ability to do all sorts of things at stages we want during compilation, at stages in that graph. Uh, as long as we can write them in Scala code, and I'm talking about real Scala code, not a DSL. It's just a main method. That is, my, that is the extent of my plugin API. There's a main method. You pass it parameters. 
and it returns an exit code which is either one or, uh, sorry, it's either zero or non-zero. If it's non-zero, compilation will stop. If it's, uh, if it's zero, then it carries on. It was successful. So this is how I would anticipate uh, plugin-like behavior being implemented in, in Fury. And of course, those modules you define can depend on libraries. So you can, you can pull in um, uh, a library for, say, wart remover, which defines the compiler plugin. And you can, uh, you can then um, run, run that on your sources. Oh, actually, wart remover doesn't run on sources, does it? But uh, it, it, can, it can look at sources or look at, uh, look at the binaries or do whatever you want it to. So let's look at some, uh, some plugins that people, people use. I, I, just, I just found a list online of popular plugins. Um, things like Wart Remover would be a library. Others like uh, things like Native Packager, which produces um, some sort of artifact. Maybe, a, uh, maybe it's a fancy jar in some way or a Docker image. That can actually happen entirely after Fury has done its work. After Fury's finished compilation, you can just do that as a, as, a, as a next phase, unrelated to Fury. It doesn't need to be part of Fury. And the opposite side of that is things like Scala format, which works in your sources. It doesn't really need to be part of the build tool. I don't really need to compromise the complexity of my build tool just to support things that aren't related to compilation. Corsier is already part of SBT. I use it for downloading binaries. Uh, S coverage, I think that, that would be really useful, and it would be great if it were much easier for us to get code coverage. So that's something I want to make part of, part of Fury. Uh, JMH, that, again, I think could be easier. So full integration is something I would like to support. Uh, Scala.js, Scala Native, these are already supported. Uh, SBT Sonotype just doesn't really need to exist. So uh, speaking of... Uh, Speaking of that, uh, publishing. The current situation with publishing is problematic, in, in my opinion. And it, it affects the whole ecosystem. So when we publish a binary to Maven Central, that's only possible if all of the dependencies, all of the binary dependencies, are already published as well. We have to wait for the authors or the maintainers of all of those libraries to publish first. Then we can publish ours and depend on them. Now, this puts all sorts of silos in the, publish, in the publication process. We're, we're waiting on people all the time. The people who are kindly devoting their time to open source as, as maintainers get this burden, and they, they feel the pressure. Uh, Sebastian Duren, who's been publishing Scala.js for uh, a few years now, he needs to make sure that as soon as Scala, a new release of Scala comes out, He's not on vacation. He needs to be available, and he, he has it in his diary. He books out the time so that he can publish Scala.js. Because if he doesn't do that, and bear in mind, until recently, Sebastian was a, just a, a humble PhD student, he has to schedule his time so that he doesn't hold up the rest of the ecosystem. Everything depends on Scala.js. Scala test depends on Scala.js. Scala test can't publish until Scala.js has. So we're waiting on him. Scala Test is published by Bill Venice. Bill does a, does a great job and has done a great job for years maintaining Scala Test, but he pays someone hard cash to do his publishing for him because he knows that the community depends on that. And we're a, we're a multi-million, probably, probably approaching multi-billion dollar industry, and we're depending on a PhD student or former PhD student to publish things quickly. There's something, there's something wrong here. It doesn't, it, it seems like there's too much pressure. And we need to distribute this work better. Uh, we can't publish to Maven Central with source dependencies. That's not, a, not an option. Uh, we could potentially publish a fat jar containing all of our dependencies from, from Fury, if we wanted to. But that's only going to cause more problems when you try and put several of these fat jars onto the same class path and expect them to work. Uh, it almost certainly won't. So I have a, a, a solution, again, based on schemas, where, remember, a schema is a variant of the... It's a copy of the workspace with, with variations. Those variations could actually be replacing source dependencies with binary dependencies. 
Now we don't have to main, we don't have to have this work all the time, but if we're if we're going to do a release that we we want to be available to people uh, with with binary dependencies, we want to make it available on Maven Central. We could do that with um, uh, with a schema replacing all those source dependencies, hoping we can find a coherent set that allows our project to compile. Uh, and then that, that's actually everything we need to publish to Maven Central if we, if we wanted to. I mean, I don't care too much, but I think you probably do care. Uh, Maven Central's not going to go away overnight. So let's talk about uh, the release for Fury. People have been asking me quite a lot recently about when it's going to be, when it's going to be released. Uh, people seem very enthusiastic, and I, I appreciate the enthusiasm. I'm, it, the, the more enthusi enthusiasm I hear, the more nervous I get that, that people are going to be disappointed. It, uh, and uh, like if, it, if, if I just sort of slipped it out the door a, a few months ago, maybe that would have been better. But uh, instead, I've gone around mostly Europe giving talks about Fury and getting people's feedback. And uh, people have heard about it. And, and now they, they have great expectations. So. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid of disappointment, uh, so I'm, I'm instinctively holding back on, on, on doing the release. Um, in fact, that, that's all I've got on the release slide for now. <laughs> um, hold, hold, hold that thought, we'll come back to it. So any, any build tool needs support, and um, I guess most people here are using SBT, and that's received excellent support from uh, yeah. Eugene and formerly Dale at, at Lightbend for a few years now. And people get a good experience from that, that support. Now, I, I can say that Fury will be fully supported by Propensive. Now, you maybe think, well, Propensive, that's, uh, that's just you. That's your Twitter handle, uh, which is true. But Propensive is also my company, uh, which is just me. So, <laughs> where is the value in this, in, in this, uh, this claim here? So, maybe you know a little bit about, uh, about what I do. Uh, I do. I do some training. I, uh, I organize a conference. And I write open source software. And, and of these three things here, uh, this one earns me money. Uh, this one breaks even, and this one is a huge drain on my resources. Um, but but I, 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 like, I like all of them, but uh, I do spend a lot of time writing open source software and, and not getting paid for it. So you maybe, maybe wonder how, how will Propensive, with all of these things going on, uh, find time to support Fury? So, uh, yeah, small business and Anyone adopting a, a new build tool is, is taking a leap of faith, and so I don't, I don't take that, that lightly. So it's my intention to give you confidence in anything I, I propose that it's not going to go away in two months, and six months. If I get run over by a bus, there will be people to, to support it. That's, what I, that's the confidence I want to give people to use Fury. So I've... Agreed a partnership deal with Virtus Lab. Uh, maybe you know Virtus. They're a uh, growing, very fast uh, software development company in Krakow, in Poland. And they have given me uh, a small team of people to work on Fury starting next month. And I am super excited about this. This gives me so much freedom to explore more possibilities with Fury that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. It should give you the confidence that it's, you're not relying on one, one guy who travels around the world and doesn't even have a permanent home. Uh, you're, you're relying on a, 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 a stable, established company that, uh, uh, that, that can support it. So I'll be working closely with them uh, over, over the next few months, and uh, hopefully that should add credibility to Fury as a viable product. Uh, so, They've got over 100 developers. They have huge experience working with uh, tooling. They've, they've done a lot of tooling work already. They organize a, a conference in, in Krakow each year. 
And I'm going to I'm writing a to-do list for them. So um, support for Windows, it's not something I care about, but I think it should be cared about. That's on their list. Uh, improvements to performance, because they are particular experts in that area. Integration testing, uh, I, don't do I don't do nearly enough testing. Uh, the ability to export to SBT. Now, why would, I, why would I do this? Well, it's part of the confidence argument as well. If I, can te if I tell you to adopt Fury, and once you, get, once you adopt Fury, you're locked in, that's less of a, uh, a viable prospect than if I say to you, adopt Fury, and if anything goes wrong, you can always export to SBT. So that's something I want to provide people, not because I think anyone should ever use it, but so that you can, you can try it out without worrying if you need to. Uh, publishing to Maven Central, uh, implementing the build server protocol. I don't have time to talk about that, but uh, general bug fixing. And uh, also work on several of my other libraries. So maybe you know I work on, on Magnolia. I'm going to give a talk on that tomorrow. Contextual Kaleidoscope. And um, I've forgotten to, uh, I forgot to close the parentheses there. Oh, no, the, it continues. Probation. Uh, there's a... There's a Oh, I've even mis I've misspelled my library. I, I, I published it yesterday, so I modified these slides, and I, it's meant to be called gastronomy. Anyway, I've, I've, I've got a load of micro libraries which uh, uh, Virtus will be helping me with. Uh, because historically, I haven't done a great job of providing excellent maintenance of these, and having some help is going to be a, a huge benefit. On my to-do list, I've got some code cleanup to do. I have uh, support for Scala, JS and Scala native to... Uh, to integrate, uh, code coverage, benchmarking, um, and there's, there's a full list of issues which I, I try to use to, to track, track the project over at, over at GitHub. Uh, the project's called Propensive slash Fury. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing some work converting the ecosystem. All of the builds that already exist out there for SBT, I'm slowly converting them to, uh, to Fury. So what I would like you to do is try out Fury. You can't do that yet because I haven't published it. That's what this little red asterisk is. I can see that my time is up. I'm aware. Um, you, you, can, you can help me out once you've started trying it. You can come to Scala World next September and, and uh, help keep me fed. And uh, if, you, if your employer would be interested in sponsoring Scholarship, please come and talk, to, uh, sponsoring Scala World, come and, come and talk to me. Uh, or, or ask me about training. I can, I can do advanced type level training. Now, the roadmap. Let's talk about the roadmap. I want version 1 out synchronized with Scala 2.13 so that we can have a bit of a race as to see who can publish the ecosystem faster for the new version of Scala. I'm starting work with Virtus Lab on, on the 1st of December. And this says that the source code will be released um, pretty soon, uh, 2.57 on the 15th of November. And uh, actually, that's meant to say, uh, well, I, I, opened the, I opened the private beta to, uh, to a few users at the end of, uh, end of October. Uh, it's 2.58 now. Um, it just, <laughs> you're, you're, you're familiar with things just getting later and later. Uh, OK, OK, let's, uh, let's, let's actually stand by what I said. So. I think all I need to do is that, and if you, if you check, if you check the Fury repository, which is, where is it, over here, if I just refresh that, the source code is now live. So, the source code is live, but uh, I, I, that, that does come with the proviso that it you have no way of building it, and uh, several of its dependencies aren't published. But you can, you can have a look at the source code, and now I've finally got, I've finally got it published, uh, which means I can now, uh, I now no longer have that hanging over my head. Instead, I have the, 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 the fear that you will look closely at my sources and uh, you'll, you'll realize I'm a terrible programmer. So just to wrap up, uh, there is a private beta opening very, very soon. I've got a few more issues to fix. As soon as the stuff I broke last night is, is fixed, I'll start sending out those, those uh, binaries. Go to propensive.com 
and uh, follow the link to Fury, and there is uh, a link there to sign up. I just take a few details, like what uh, terminal you're using. And that's, that's all I've got. And uh, I just want to say, uh, I've run out of time, and I've gone over. And uh, I'm going to be around for the next three days, so please come and ask me questions. Um, I'm happy to answer anything. Um, and thank you for coming and listening. <laughs>